You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are still sharing wonderful stories of Hispanic Heritage Month, and so looking at how the Lord is working in Hispanic cultures. And we're going to dig into some great resources and the work of our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin, for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, the Reverend Dr. Matthew Heisey, Executive Director for Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Dr. Heisey, welcome back to the Coffee Hour. Always good to be with you, Andy and Sarah. We always appreciate the updates you provide for us on the Lord's work and how God is providing resources, faithful resources, to support the the faith of those around the world in their language. So how is the Lord providing for and uh, reaching people with resources of Hispanic heritage with uh, these Christ-centered resources from Lutheran Heritage Foundation today? Well, let, let me kind of start with how we began because we we didn't, you know, we've been in existence since 1992, but we really didn't start doing Spanish work till about 2008. And we started with this combined small catechism in the front of the Bible. So you'd get a regular Bible translation. You wouldn't do the Bible translation, but you would have a Bible translation. And then the small catechism was translated. And that was the idea of a then missionary, Reverend Dan McMiller in Panama, who had this idea of putting the catechism kind of as a teaching tool in front of the Bible. And we we're up to about seven or eight editions of this now. It's just, it's been be- very, very effective. And as people use that Bible throughout the Latin America and the States, we often hear how they really enjoy that front part of the Bible. So we always have to kind of, you know, truth in advertising. Well, this isn't part of the Bible, but it is Martin Luther's teaching tool that helps explain so much of what's in the Bible. And so beginning with, you know, Pastor McMiller ultimately became the executive director of the Office of International Mission. And from 2008 to 2022, we did printed and distributed about 165,000 Spanish language books. Now, just in 2024, we have actually printed 128,000, so almost doubling it just within this year. So, you know, we're talking about close to 300,000 books, including that Bible catechism, a standalone small catechism, theological texts for pastors and seminarians on baptism, Holy Communion, children's Bible story books, confirmation series, all kinds of things. And now actually daily devotions, the word of the Lord endures forever. It's a, a quarterly devotion now that we've been doing in partnership with the mission team and Pastor Cray in the Dominican Republic. So since 2023, we did four there and we have three editions out now. And we'll soon add that fourth one at the end of this year. So these are all tools that we've had the opportunity to use. Who are some of the people that you're able to partner with? I know you mentioned Ted Cray and the team in the in the Dominican Republic. Who else do you work with to produce these resources uh, specifically in the Spanish language? Well, we do really rely heavily upon him. Originally, we worked with Argentinians. And, but right now he, he has been kind of a prime driver behind a lot of this because uh, I'm, I'm sure you've had him on your program before the work that he's been doing, not only here, but throughout South America, Central America is, is, is really mind blowing, not to mention the Caribbean. So, uh, for the most part, he ends up using then translators, a lot of them from South America and Mexico. So those people who are being trained in his seminary there in the Dominican Republic, are going back to their home countries and also doing some of that translation work. So that really, I think, covers continents, North and South America. Let's talk a a bit about one of the resources I think you might have mentioned in the Spanish language, hymnals. How are hymnals valuable? The, the, the newest development in the hymnal, I think, has, has really been a great resource to our brothers and sisters in Christ in Spanish-speaking countries and cultures. Well, and thank you, Andy, for reminding me, because that's the one thing I didn't mention. Oh. <laughs> I, I left out the Spanish hymnal. I don't know how I could do that, because that was finally, I, originally, the, they had been working on it. And when I became executive director in 2014, I went to one of their ILC meetings in Venezuela, and uh, when you could really go to Venezuela. And they were talking about uh, Pastor Rautenberg from, at that time, Chile, he's back in Argentina now, had talked about, we really need help 
in getting this printed. And so not only did we help provide support financially, but also logistically in doing the layout. We did that in Thailand and we used the paper printing in Thailand and shipped that to South and North America. It's still less expensive than doing it in Brazil or another country in South America. And the quality is with the team that we work with is, is very, very good. And so now we've just come out this year with a second edition. And people who want to get a hold of that, well, if they previously ordered a first edition copy, all they need to do is contact us or the Office of National Mission in St. Louis, and they can get that for $5. The second edition copies have now been reduced to $10. So I mean, these are over a thousand pages. I mean, they, they are really huge resources, which are you know, crafted for people who are using guitar, for piano, organ, you name it. So it's, it's really an, an outstanding resource. And when we share this with, you know, pastors, especially in the States, they're just, they're, they're just amazed at having a resource like this available in their language. Talk a little bit more about what went into making a Spanish language hymnal, because this wasn't just taking our Lutheran service book and and straight translating everything specifically in LS. Like this isn't just a Spanish language a version of our Lutheran service book. Talk about what makes this hymnal very unique and, and so helpful for Spanish language uh, congregations and people. Yeah, you're right to make that point, Sarah, because while we do have some of those traditional songs that we would know, like Thy Strong Word, A, a Mighty Fortress, translated into Spanish, there are also hymns that Spanish Lutherans have been singing for now generations. And, and so they, we relied upon the teams there in the Dominican Republic and South America to, to obviously choose what they wanted. I mean, they were working at this on this project even before I became executive director 10 years ago. So this has been a long process. Great deal of thought and prayer has gone into what they need to do. So yeah, it, it, it will include uh, a, a wide selection of hymns and spiritual songs that I think would appeal to most anybody. Have you had the opportunity to see the hymnals in use in a congregation? Actually, I saw that when they introduced it in the Dominican Republic. So that, that was a great opportunity to, to actually see them teach it to seminarians and other people in the congregation there in the Dominican Republic. While I haven't seen it, I have actually provided a large number of copies for St. Stephen's Lutheran Church in Southwest Detroit. It's the kind of like the family parish where my grandparents came over from Russia. They, they were married there. My parents were married there. My sister and her husband were married there, and they are now active. My sister's active in the VBS program there at St. Stephen's, and now under the tutelage of Pastor Ricardo Granado, who is a Venezuelan, this congregation has grown to about 50. He's just started a youth group, and I, I shared with my sister the other day, I said, oh, we actually have daily devotions, too, online. She said, oh, okay, then we, I got to let him know about it. And he is just thrilled because he's starting, you know, this congregation from scratch in southwest Detroit. Mind you, that old neighborhood was a German-speaking and that's where a lot of my, my relatives lived in that area. Well, it's, it's overwhelmingly Spanish speaking today. So, I mean, it, it is the story of American immigration, how neighborhoods change and churches do not adapt to that. They die. And while the English language congregation is, is naturally becoming smaller, the Spanish congregation is growing and now they have hymnal resources that they can actually use. So to be able to use that within their congregation, and this is shared throughout the United States too, with many other congregations. There was just a pastor ordained in Chicago, Pastor Ted Fisher, who was doing outreach in Hispanic missions, and he was a former missionary to Gu Guatemala. So we were just connecting, saying, hey, you know, as you get this congregation going, we have hymnals, we have other resources for you. And he said, oh, I'll, I'll be in contact with you for sure. So uh, we know they are being used because they disappear pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, that, that is fantastic. What kind of difference does that make for these congregations to have 
a, a hymnal that connects them with other people who are also using the same resources. What what shift has that made in these congregations? Well, I, I can't speak to how that would connect with the entire grouping of uh, Hispanic congregations within the LCMS. Uh, hopefully, maybe I can give you a, a better update on that next year because the Hispanic Convention is supposed to meet in California and they're working out the details on that. And then maybe we'll get a better picture as to what that looks like. Because the last Hispanic convention, I want to say it was 2021. I don't think it was 2022. And so it was one of those things during COVID, you know, one of the, uh, the difficulty of gathering people. And we had just handed out the first edition of the hymnal. So it was all completely new to them. And so there was nothing organized to actually, they did sing a few hymns from there but they, they weren't able to follow as much on that. I would imagine the next convention will use that really as their primary resource for liturgy, for hymns. So, But I think as Spanish speakers travel, this is going to provide an opportunity for them to say, if I'm in Detroit, if I'm in Chicago, I can go into that congregation. Oh, I know those hymns. I know those hymns. I know the, that liturgy. I Yeah, what a blessing to have a resource that provides that. Um, connection among those congregations. We are talking with the Reverend Dr. Matthew Heisey, Executive Director of Lutheran Heritage Foundation. It is Hispanic Heritage Month. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Hispanic Heritage Month. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Matthew Heisey, Executive Director for Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Dr. Heisey, you, you've painted a nice picture for us of understanding how the, the new Spanish language hymnal is being used and put to use. What about resources for children and families from Lutheran Heritage Foundation in the Spanish language that are being utilized? How do you see those being um, used and welcomed into homes? Well, those, those children's Bible story books, they disappear quicker than anything else. I mean, we always just say, if you want a children's Bible story book, and we have a hard cover and a soft cover edition, get them quick because they, they just, they're, they're gone before you know it. And so those are very helpful, especially in BBS settings. But now as we get more Spanish speaking congregations, you know, this will be something that I think a lot of us grew up with in our own congregations where we had a Bible story book. And going to a Lutheran grade school like I did, you know, we were able to 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 utilize that obviously in English. So once again, uh, I mean, Spanish is among the when I I put together a list of the according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the top ten languages spoken in the United States. Naturally, Spanish is is far and away the first language. Surprisingly, Mandarin is second there too. So that's also growing. But having Spanish as the language among so many people, and not just in the border regions, but throughout the United States, I mean, I think it's imperative to have something like this. And, and so that was actually a more recent translation of ours, maybe five, six years ago, I think, when we first started doing that. So to have that, now also to have daily devotions and confirmation series, you know, we're able to begin to to work with children as they begin and as they grow a little bit older and get into a catechism for confirmation as well. So that's, that, that's really helpful. I should kind of mention too, while I'm at it, when we talk about, you know, what, where, where are you seeing a lot of these resources go? And, and basically, there's a couple of answers for that. One of those is migrant outreach. You will find a lot of Hispanics working in the factories or in, in fields, farm fields and so forth. And so as migrants come up, and this is a way 
to reach out to local migrants. I know a, a little old lady, she's, gosh, she's got to be close to 100 now, up in Winona, Minnesota. And good old Lori Steber would, she, she requested Bible. She says, I am, I am teaching Hispanic migrants English, but I want them to have a Bible in Spanish. <laughs> so when she was, I think, a sprightly 96, we sent her some of those there. And I, I think of people like her who, you know, here's somebody who's in there approaching the century mark and, and still finding a way, okay, how can I do, how can I be part of the church? Because, you know, I can't travel as much as I used to or, or drive as much as I used to. But that migrant outreach is, is really important. And, and secondly, short-term mission trips. You know, we, I, I got a whole list of, of people who, who go on mission trips. For example, an optometrist who does vision care missions in Central America. And so the Jesus Never Fails devotional booklet, small catechism, you know, he's, he's asking for copies of this. I need to bring some of those with me as I go on a mission trip. And, and so we get both of those, migrant outreach and maybe growing Spanish-speaking congregations, and then these short-term mission trips. And, and we work with the most ministries in Michigan, Mission Opportunity Short Term, that does the eyeglass clinics primarily. And uh, Director Marty Morrow and I are the same age, so we went through the same Detroit Lutheran high, high school circles and grade school circles. And so I know Marty does great work there. And they're able to take some of our books, too, for a lot of their short-term mission work in Latin America. How have you seen Spanish language resources growing over the years? I, I think you mentioned that, that Spanish language started in, in 2008, if I remember correct. right. Correct. Yeah. You remember how correct. Have, how have you seen that expand over the years, and where do you see uh, the the opportunities for more growth in the coming years? Well, I th I think right now, I mean, the the key here is 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 just expanding into so many different opportunities. And here, once again, we're working with the mission field. I mean, we're working with Pastor Ted Cray predominantly there in the Dominican Republic, also over in Spain. What what are their needs? Because that's one of the things we usually ask. I mean, you know, the, there's always somebody who's a real go-getter and says, oh, I think we should translate this book. And we say, did you, who are you talking to? Well, I just think it's a good idea. You know, okay, it might be a good idea to you, but talk to the local churches, talk to the mission centers, and, you know, what are they finding that's most important? And so what we've done now, especially, is, is go into some of these deeper theological books, you know, large catechism, uh, Holy Communion, in-depth kind of resources for not only pastors and seminarians, but also for interested lay people as they grow in the faith. I think the daily devotions too, in particular, is really important because it's, it's providing a need that's not being met right now. And, and so to be able to, to get this out right now, we do most of it online, but we're hope, hoping that perhaps we can print some of these, especially for older people. Uh, right now, I just kind of tell them, print it out, print it out in large print. But, you know, as we get more and more support and we are getting people who say, gee, I want to support Spanish resources because these are really important. And then also, to be honest with you, prison ministry. We, my colleague, our assistant executive director, Jeffrey Ron, was in Southern Illinois earlier this year, and he went to the prison ministry conference. And we're finding, of course, that there are, of course, a lot many Spanish speakers who are unfortunately imprisoned, and there are great opportunities to do outreach to them. So we learn a lot about, you know, we can't give them hardcover copies. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's used as a weapon or, but the hardcover copies can't go into the prison, softcover. So, okay, we got to provide softcover resources. But a lot of the LCMS chaplains and others working in prisons are excited to see that, gee, you know, if I'm reaching out to Spanish speakers and I don't have anything, you have it. And so we're, we're really pleased to be able to do that. And I'm, I'm grateful, especially to the new All Nations Ministry man Manager, Pastor Stephen Heimer, because many are aware that Stephen actually in the past worked on the border of El Paso and Chaudet Juarez. And he was crossing the border regularly in the Isoleta mission doing a lot of outreach. In fact, if you go to our website, there's a picture that's usually the first one that pops up. And it's the Spanish speakers all holding the, the Bible with the catechism. And they're just holding it up with these joyful expressions. 
And Stephen told me, he said, you know, I didn't stage that. <laughs> they just all of a sudden just started, they were thrilled to get them. And this was in a town called Anapa, just south of New Mexico in Las Cruces. And so we put that on our website and I encourage people to take a look at that. And you can see the joy in their faces. And I think of what some of those people who live in border regions have to deal with on a daily fashion, drug cartels and the danger that is always present there and the, and the evil that goes on with, with some of the witchcraft along the border regions on both sides. And, and so to be able to have Bibles and, and, and faithful teachers who can help them with that ministry outreach, that, that, that's, that's really important. So I guess I went on a little further than, than your question led me. <laughs> well, tell us about, you mentioned earlier you know, partnering with and, and building relationships with the uh, local missionaries and the local partner churches. Tell us a little bit more about what it means to to build those relationships, to get to know the local church, the local partner church and the missionaries, to find out what those needs are. What what does it look like to, to build those relationships? Well, once again, it's it's one of those things that now, while we're talking about Spanish, it is Hispanic Heritage Month. And what we discover as we begin to talk to some of those local church leaders is some of them have actually a different language that certain people would recognize as their primary language and Spanish as their secondary language. So for example, Quechua is a language in the Andes mountain regions there in Bolivia, in Peru. And so these are some resources now that we're starting to develop because the church needs it. And they're doing actually great outreach in the Andes mountains regions. So here, okay, it's, it's once again, I mean, we, our, our minds have to expand a bit beyond what, you know, and know what people want. It's well, like I always say with Ukraine, you know, people say, oh, you need Ukrainian. I said, not necessarily. You need Russian for a lot. Kiev is a Russian speaking city. It's my wife's home, home city there. And she studied at the medical institute in Russian. So, uh, you know, what we think is the language people use is not necessarily their heart language. And so we have a pastor up in Portland, Oregon, who's Heart language is Mayan, and his parents live in the Yucatan Peninsula right now. So they're in that area. They have nothing in Mayan, and a lot of people don't really resonate with Spanish. They speak Mayan. So we said, okay, how do we do this? Okay, he says, I, I'm, that's why I'm here. And we said, that's why you're here. So once again, listening to people as to what they need, and perhaps if there is an, another language that Hispanics are resonating with and addressing as their heart language, then we need to know that too. We've talked about so many great resources. If people are listening and, and know people who might be able to use these resources or, or want to be able to reach into communities around them with these resources, how can people find what they need and, and just know how to use all of these great things that you have available? Yeah, we have a, a website, lhfmissions.org. And lhfmissions, make sure you got that plural, .org. And then they can go to the publication page. And if you do that, it's, it's, it's very user-friendly now. You can find, for example, okay, I want to look by language, by book title, by author, by topic. And so if I wanted to go to that page, I would say Spanish. And as I go to Spanish, it would also list the countries where we are getting requests and where we work. And then they can go down the list and say, okay, this is, this is what I want. Then we urge them, please write to us. My job and the job of several others is to raise the funds for it. We, we don't ask people uh, to pay for something. We do you know, give, for example, like a children's Bible story book. We'll put a recommended price in there, $5. Uh, which is what it takes to kind of produce it. Uh, but that is, uh, the person doesn't have to have money and pay us for it. We will give it to them free. That's that's our task, to find the support. And we do have so many faithful donors and supporters who help us so that we can provide these books at no charge to people and ministries that will need them. 
You can learn more again at lhfmissions.org. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Matthew Heisey, Executive Director for Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Dr. Heisey, thank you for being our guest and sharing great stories with us today. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.